Hi my loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing a long overdue December books video. Sorry it's taken me so long. I am catching up and January books will be swiftly following. I feel like my year has just begun with February. I feel like I finally got into the swing of things. But anyway my loves, let's talk December books. December was a bit of a blur. It was not a great month <laughs> so and I always feel like that really affects my reading and it also really affects my ability to recount books to you and talk about them in a sort of useful way. For example I do wonder whether if I'd read some of these at different times of the year whether they would have made their way into my top 2020 books. I obviously gave a couple of them honourable mentions in my top 2020 books video but you know it's impossible to tell these things um, unless I was to reread them. Let's talk first and sort of briefly about A Christmas Carol. Um, I had this copy, but Zach put this really lovely copy in my um, stocking and it's got gold pages and it's very nice, it feels Christmassy, so I might crack this one out again next year. But anyway, and I have to admit, I did not read the other Christmas stories in this book. I just read A Christmas Carol. So I'm going to save the other ones for next year. But yes, in general, I can't believe I've never read this before this year. As a person that loves Dickens, as a person that loves Christmas, um, it seems like an oversight on my part to have waited 26 years to have read it. I don't think I need to talk to you too much about the plot of A Christmas Carol. It's obviously about Scrooge, who is a bit of a Scrooge. His name has entered our common vocabulary. He hates Christmas, he hates charity, he's a miser. He's devoid of love in his life. And he's visited by ghosts, past, present and future to reinvigorate him and to reinstill life in him. And he ends up a changed man. We all know the plot. But yes, I'm happy to conclude that this was not a disappointment. It's a lovely cosy tale. It's obviously a bit didactic and moralising. It is Dickens after all. But it's also sort of shaped a lot of the way we see Christmas um, today particularly in, I think, Merry Christmas became more widely used after being mentioned in this book, before it was Happy Christmas only. <laughs> um, uh, and also it's sort of humanitarian leanings. It's heartwarming. I think it remains quite accessible to a modern audience, even someone who's sort of less familiar with classics and generally doesn't read classics. I think it's still quite accessible. Um, this edition has some lovely... Um, sort of illustrations as well, the original illustrations, which is so nice. But yes, I highly recommend it um, for next Christmas. If you've never read it, I don't think it disappoints. I think you could curl up by the fire or just curl up with a cup of tea or something <laughs> on Christmas Eve and read this and feel very cosy, very warm. Feel like your heart has been warmed. So that is A Christmas Carol. So next, let's talk about That Reminds Me by Derek Awusu. This one I did have quite a lot of trouble remembering because I read it way, way back at the beginning of December. And I think I read it in a few hours because it is a slim book, but lots of people have written really, really beautiful reviews of this. I was kind of put onto it, I suppose, by Book Buddy Reads, um, a bookstagrammer who I follow, who um, she has raved about this a lot. So I was very intrigued by it. I believe it's the first book that Stormzy's imprint, Murky Books, published, um, which is quite exciting. Um, but anyway, this is one of those books that sort of defies categorization. Um, it's raw, powerful, searingly honest and heart-wrenching. I suppose it would be best described as prose poetry. I think Derek Owusu is best known for his poetry. It's made up of fragments that depict the coming of age the childhood and the adolescence of the protagonist who is called Kay. He's a boy born in London to Ghanaian parents um, and for a brief time he is also in foster care in Suffolk so he has a kind of countryside experience as well. As he matures he really struggles with his mental health, um, he's eventually I think diagnosed with borderline personality disorder um, and this book is really heavy. <laughs> Um, so a big trigger warning on this for all sorts of things and at times it can be really bleak So make sure you enter it knowing that and sort of prepared for that sort of experience because it is a lot But yes, a trigger warning for suicide, self-harm, alcoholism um, and 
just severe mental health problems. He also kind of struggles on a wider level with his racial identity and his um, masculinity uh, in the context of growing up in Tottenham in the 1990s. So Owusu's lyricism in this book does not disappoint. Um, the prose is at times really beautiful and tender, at others it's raw and unflinching. Um, it's very fragmentary, so prepare for that going in. It will require a bit of kind of deciphering what exactly is happening. I think it would definitely benefit from a few rereads from me just to get all the layers because it is a really complex work and a very accomplished piece of work as well. Um, there's not much I could say to fault it, but it is not for the faint of heart. But if this poetic coming of age sounds like your kind of thing, I would definitely, definitely recommend it. Um, it's a really excellent example of what it is and I will definitely be keeping my eye on the author in the future. Next we have The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, me and my, probably one of my favourite books I have on my shelves. I'm just I'm obsessed with this copy. I've talked about it so many times but I really am obsessed with this retro copy. Um, again I will leave the ISBN and whatever down below but I haven't seen anyone else selling this edition. Um, since I bought this one. But anyway, this is a classic science fiction novel set in Le Guin's Hainish universe, her kind of space opera sci-fi universe, Earthsea being her sort of fantasy universe. And I've said before that I do prefer Earthsea over the Hainish universe, uh, even though the ideas in here are amazing. I like both, but I do just prefer the Earthsea, I think, just for the tenderness of that series over this one. But Anyway, back to this. <laughs> this is a classic science fiction. Um, this one, the Hugo and the Nebula and the Left Hand of Darkness, which is the one that precedes it, um, also did. Anyway, she was definitely garnering a lot of interest as a science fiction author by this point. So this explores the worlds of two neighbouring planets, Uras and Anaris. Anaris is actually, I believe, a moon of Uras's and is essentially like a satellite colony because a group of people from Uras moved to Anaris to establish a socialist anarchist society um, to get away from the sort of capitalist individualism of Uras. So in real time, in terms of the plot line, the novel explores the journey of a physicist from Anaris um, who goes to Uras. He's the first to return since they all left. Yes, this novel is really, really complex and explores both the worlds really, really sensitively, both the systems of power, um, and yeah, explores them sensitively in really great detail. Um, for example, there are differences between the nations on your ass as well, and none are really shown to be wholly good or wholly bad. Le Guin is queen of the grey area <laughs> uh, and she just does such a good job of really looking at the nuances and subtleties of these things. And for that reason, this book is kind of a work of genius. I can see why it won its awards. To touch on all these things in the scope of a novel like this is quite incredible. Um, however, I did struggle to get into this book. It is kind of a bit slow. Um, there was a less meaningful blend of plot and character for me. Um, like I find in Earthsea, I always find that blend to be perfect there, whereas this feels a little bit more clunky. It's definitely the case in this book that the ideas are more important to Le Guin than the plot and the character, um, and this does have the effect of slowing the pace of the book a little bit, making it drag a bit in the reading experience. I was quite distracted reading it, so again, it might benefit from a reread from me at some stage, and I think I will anyway, just because it is kind of a work of genius, like I said but I definitely think that this is worth reading, but just be prepared for it to feel a little bit slow and stilted at times. But in terms of the ideas, you cannot fault it. Next, we have much more contemporary sci-fi. This is Rosewater by Tate Thompson. This is a really imaginative, gripping and distinctive science fiction novel that expertly plays with the alien invasion trope and sort of makes it new and fresh. Um, and unexpected. So it follows Caro, who is a government agent living in Rosewater, which is a fairly new town that sort of exploded into being. Um, he's living there in 2066, but yes, it's a fairly new town that has grown up around this alien biodome, and very occasionally this biodome seems to sort of open up, or something weird seems to happen, and everyone in the immediate vicinity is healed of all their ailments. So this naturally attract, 
sites, kind of pilgrimages and worship of a kind. And also Caro has special abilities. He can read minds, he can um, find things that have belonged to people. And yes, yeah, so he's living and working in Rosewater. Um, it reads like a thriller, it's packed with pro plot line. Um, sometimes it's timeline, it's too all over the place, it really really jumps back and forth. If this is a pet peeve of yours, you're not going to like this book. Um, people do complain about it. It didn't bother me too much, but because I was a bit distracted reading it, and I do think it does it even more than other novels that do it, it did feel a little bit disorientating sometimes. But I love the world Thompson created, it's kind of believable. <laughs> within the context of the novel. Um, it's clever and inventive, and yeah, there's lots in here to kind of make it unique and stand out from other science fiction today. Um, I definitely think I will read the remaining novels in the series, but something is stopping me from reaching for them right away. When I read N.K. Jemisin's The Fifth Season, for example, I immediately ordered the other two books and read them back to back. Um, I didn't have this that experience with this, and that is namely because of the protagonist, Caro. Um, he is misogynistic, he's deeply unlikable, um, he has few redeeming features. There's not a lot to kind of explain why he's so unlikable either and he's, yeah, just not very pleasant to read from. And this is something it seems that Thompson is completely aware of. He kind of points directly to Caro's misogyny at various stages and the way he talks about, thinks about and interacts with women. And a lot of the time I can deal with an unlikable protagonist. It doesn't tend to bother me. When people complain about that in other books, I don't necessarily find it justified for myself. So I tried to figure out what it was particularly about this unlikable protagonist that I just couldn't get on board with. Um, and I think it's because with other books, if the protagonist is unlikable, unpleasant. In the best books, there's usually a really, really good reason why that is. Um, and it, their unlikability sort of serves an important purpose to demonstrate something to the reader. Whereas here, I was like, what is the point of this being, of him being like this? Um, it's a first person narration, so we're really, really close to him. Um, and we sort of seem to want to root for him. He seems to have ideas that might resonate with us as readers about his own world. Perhaps that's the point in that we're supposed to get where he's coming from but still not like him. I don't know. Especially I feel like this would be a problem with, for female readers because yeah, the misogyny is a bit much. So yeah, I think at the end of the day I was just confused as to why he had to be so unlikable and why he couldn't just be, just have like one redeeming feature or just have a little bit of softness to balance it out, if you know what I mean. Um, not to say that there aren't people like Caro in the world, <laughs> but yeah, it just didn't do it for me. Anyway, I feel like I've talked about that for ages now. It felt too masculine, I think, for me at times. Also, it has a kind of cyberpunky style, which is something I typically don't enjoy in book form. Um, I enjoy it more visually, like in films and stuff, but book form, I prefer it less. So these things stopped me from connecting with this book quite as much as I really wanted to, because I found it inventive and exciting um, in other ways, but I just couldn't quite connect with it on that level that makes it a really, really standout book. And I hope that makes sense. But yes, that's why I have not immediately jumped into the rest of the series. Okay, next we have Dear Life by Alice Munro. I have talked about Alice Munro a fair amount. Very famous um, short story writer. She is like queen of the short story, basically. <laughs> Um, and this is her most recent book, published in 2012. I think she's in her mid to late 80s now, definitely reaching sort of the end of her career with this book compared to A Progress of Love, which I read and loved, which is more, I think, kind of more at the height and peak of her career. And so I found that these stories were good, solid pieces of work. And there's a few gems in here that I particularly liked. I really liked Amundsen, I think it's called. I also liked some of the more semi-autobiographical stories towards the end of the book, but I didn't feel like they had the life and verve of some of her earlier stories. So yes, I'm still going to read the rest of Munro's collections, but I feel like maybe this wasn't the one to go for next. She has this signature simple paired back style that really belies the complexity of her themes um, and the significance of some of the story's pivotal moments. Um, like in life, sometimes you will <laughs> get to the end of the story and then realise what was the pivotal moment and in the time of reading it you 
didn't really notice or didn't see how significant it was. She really manages to capture also the strangeness and absurdity of everyday life. Um, somehow sort of drawing you in towards her characters and at the same time keeping you at a remove so that you can kind of see how strange even the most ordinary situations are and how weird humans are basically. Looking forward to reading more Munro in the future. I've got a couple more on my shelves at home. This was not my favourite collection. So finally we have a book that I listened to which is Love and Colour by Bolu Babalola and I followed Bolu on Twitter for a few years now and I wanted to show my support for her and read her first book. I think she's got another book coming out next year called Honey and Spice which is a novel. This is a book of short stories. This is a book of love stories based on existing narratives from history and mythology and folklore from around the world and there's a few of her own, completely her own stories thrown in at the end I think as well. And the book is born of Babalola's desire to see more women of colour depicted in romance and depicted as happy and in love and worthy of love to sort of balance out the deluge of fiction about the trauma of black life. Um, so in this, I think she really largely succeeds. Her prose is really accomplished and smooth for a debut author. And I think this book will have large appeal. Um, and I also think that her own stories that weren't based on the mythological um, characters or narratives were actually the best. They felt more organic and easy and less rushed um, because there's not a lot of time to get completely invested in the stories because they're quite short. Um, some of them do feel a bit rushed, but I think her debut novel, Honey and Spice, might work for you if you found hints of things you liked in this book. Um, so with that being said, we all know I don't like romance very much. Um, not because I look down on it as a genre, I read a lot of genre fiction of other kinds. I just don't love reading it. Um, I think it's partly because my favourite romantic stories are about long lasting, deep rooted, calm, peaceful love. Um, so that do doesn't have a lot of drama. Difficulties, yes. Things you grow together through, yes, but not so much drama. If there is drama, my brain just shuts off. I just think, why are you bothering? <laughs> Find someone else. Find someone new. Um, so rather inevitably, I was never going to love this book. Um, and if this is you too, I don't think this book is going to change your mind about romance forever. Um, and it does make me somewhat unqualified to comment on the quality of the romance um, compared to other romance fiction because I don't know as much about it and I don't read as much of it. If you do like romance and your attention span is short at the minute, you might really get on with these stories. Um, and I do recommend that you give them a try. Uh, like I said, I listened to these, which was good. There was a couple of narrators, one of which was much better than the other. <laughs> but in general, it was a good experience. So yes, I think that is all my books for this month. So I will be back soon with my January books and I will mention um, my next book club pick in that video. So keep an eye out for that. Hope you all enjoyed today and I will see you again very soon. Bye.